Let's get started. A po patos kajmanos. Hadith. Cayenne stele o astor ton hex. Within the kingdom of love, where our heart dwells. And here do we endure the Bayoun 
God in its unity and in love. Love is our essence and our nature. It tinctures the pure expression of the will. In honor of this nameless God, with the love of the goddess, and by the zeal of our spiritual aspiration, are we able to see the soul unveiled, that we might know each other in the light, in beauty, truth, and love, and by way of the essence that is the pure will in each of us. Do we in peace and harmony also adore this golden and magical child of the Bayou and God? We must always endeavor to seek light through the strife of contending forces. Rejoice, therefore, that through thy trials thou shalt triumph. The Master has said, Blessed art thou. Yet, O aspirants, let thy victories bring thee not to vanity. With the increase of gnosis should come the increase of wisdom. Be sure that thy soul is steadfast. Fear is failure and the forerunner of failure, and courage is the beginning of virtue. Therefore, fear not the spirits, but be firm and courteous with them. We are what we each make of ourselves, our actions affecting each ourselves and also the entire universe. Worship and neglect not the physical body, which is thy temporary connection to the outer material world. Knowledge of the heart starts by strengthening and controlling the animal passions, and by disciplining both the emotions and the reason. Strive ever to nourish the higher aspirations. Verily in heart do we good unto others for its own sake, and not for any gratuity. Remember that unbalanced force is evil. We must ever act passionately, think rationally, and each must be thyself. Truly also have the greatest self-respect and accumulate virtue in all that you do. Virtue is the prelude to holiness. The material act is but the outward expression of our thoughts. We must strive ever to the control of thought, and the fixity of our intent. Establish thyself firmly in the equilibrium of forces, in the center of the cross of the elements, that rosy cross from whose center the creative word issued in the birth of the dawning universe. Therefore must we be prompt and active as the selves, avoiding frivolity and caprice. We must be energetic and strong like the salamanders, avoiding irritability and ferocity. Also, we must be flexible and attentive to images like the undines, avoiding idleness and changeability. And finally, we should be laborious and patient like the gnomes, avoiding grossness and avarice. In true religion there is no sect. Therefore take heed that thou blaspheme not the name by which another knoweth his God. For if thou do this thing in Judah, thou wilt blaspheme Jehovah, and Osiris Yeshua. Ask, and he shall have. Seek, and he shall Knock and it shall be opened unto you. about revealed religion. <coughs> the mouths of 
dogs. In pre agrarian times, uh, Aboriginal people found uh, uh, we, we, we formed hunter gatherer tribes. And the shaman ruled and guided the people. He took them to fertile ground where animals were plenty to hunt, uh, fruits and nuts were easy to gather. And uh, he healed their afflictions. He was responsible for telling stories. Uh, the elders, the ancestors, myths of the gods and spirits, forces of nature. He composed these into myths. This defined the tribe. Uh, it gave it its identity. And of course, he was the one who had that exclusive contact with the gods, with the spirit forces. Uh, the stories in the myths uh, day to day exigencies of the tribe, uh, how the tribe was performing, the problems it ran into. He was the one who contacted the spirits, sought out advice, and helped to solve problems. So he was also the healer. Culture, and, uh, uh, we began to formulate and organize ourselves into agrarian city-states. These were more sophisticated arrangements, and the shaman that was leader of the tribe becomes, in a sense, the king, the ruling dictator, the politician. Now, such a king or a pharaoh who might be called God, another king might have soothsayers, or what have you, but, you know, Moses was the, was the king of the Jews, you know, in his time. Uh, Mohammed was the, the, the king of, of the become uh, Muslim, uh, these Arabs and other types. So uh, a new type of population is created, and, and this uh, particular being would become you know, a messenger of the spirits, and through him, communication would be to a larger body of people. And it was a larger body, we weren't in the same tribe anymore. Um, Moses, of course, as I said, is, is the most famous of these, uh, he receives the Torah and the Sinai. Um, short time later, we say, you know, it said that Muhammad talking to an angel, uh, Gabriel, in a cave, uh, is taught how to write and write the Quran. So it's its own miraculous reception, or some proof is given to that perception. God saw a bird, Moses rather saw a God in a burning bush that would not burn. So some supernatural event uh, accompanies. Um, Christianity posits this coming into a person and taking over that person that that person becomes God. Um, its message is not as specifically clear as, say, the Bible, you know, the Torah or the Tanakh and um, uh, the Quran, but eventually these writings by various people get said to be God working through, you know, multiple agency to create this one central source. And then, of course, the Pope is given that uh, political authority. You know, we, we move into modern times now, and, and many people have really developed the talent of prophecy. I think we live in a world where a lot of people are being recognized. We might be critical of some of these prophecies, from Joseph Smith and the Mormons to um, the latest fat guru who just wrote a book. Uh, but a lot of people are, you know, coming you know, through the Judaic tradition and the Greco-Roman culture, uh, we're finding it in artwork and culture, these Sacro mystics uh, that are seeing us. Uh, you know, but even in ancient times, or classical times with these city-states, artists such as Homer with the Iliad and the Odyssey, you know, these things are prophetic stories. And, and you know, based on the whole idea of the story, you know, a story written in the skies. The Hebrew prophets even began to tell us you didn't have to be a king. It wasn't exclusive anymore. You know, there's a whole, the Tanakh, the larger collection of Jewish canon, is really a whole set of prophecies by different men along these times. Uh, and so, you know, they communicated with God, they communicated with spirits, angels, what have you, and they still came back to write these books called Apocalypse back to tell us what was going on. They would journey down into the seven heavens. So, 
you know, a revealed religion is something that comes to us through this medium, this uh, set of writings, sacred scriptures, what have you. Um, but these scriptures are corroborated through special people that may not be so isolated as just a king anymore, but maybe people with talent perhaps we can say the human race is slowly evolving or has been for a long time. Uh, with you know, remarkable people coming, you know, coming to us and being born in our midst more frequently than we might imagine. Um, and so, so in each case, this, this, these texts, these scripts become new gnosis. They affect the people in one way, shape, or form. It doesn't matter that they don't particularly affect us. It, it, it matters not that we care for the Quran or don't care for the Quran. We're gathered around a different set of texts. Uh, but even then, we, produce, we, we really absorbed here at the church and absorbed a larger body of texts. So it's not just the political, it's the ancient Gnostic texts. And we acknowledge that there are new uh, uh, And you know, So like I said often in, in a lot of places, uh, it's up to us in our generation to make our own contact with the divine. Uh, revelation is a divine message. It's spoken by God. But we, have, not just as uh, any prophets that might have been amongst us, uh, have to hear that voice of God, but I think we have to recognize it when we hear it ourselves, that that person is a genuine prophet, that there's something being communicated here. We have to not recognize that no to be able to distinguish between that and say a lot of psychotic cop trap that might come along. Uh, and certainly that's the dark side of all this. There's that, that relative danger that frivolous prophets would prop up just to you know, try to uh, you know, further their own agenda, so, shall we say. Um, we can, with a process of reason, you know, identify these false prophets. We understand certain code words and certain, uh, 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 certain uh, common try to constantly use. So at least we have a beginning towards a methodology people, or maybe just some honest-seeking people who are just misleading themselves as much as others. And of course, on a deeper level, that's what the Kabbalah is about, an understanding of the mythos of our time, an understanding of the symbols and connections to symbols with different traditions that exist on the planet today, different traditions you know, that existed in time and the different kinds of ways human, humanity organized itself into culture. Um, for Liber Al, probably our central most important document, you know, Crowley presents his own proof using uh, the Hebrew Kabbalah. And so Kabbalah is essential because it's, it's a mystical transmission. It's one generation talking down to the next. It's mouth to ear. So there, the oral transition, the stories that we tell, the rituals that we create, the times that we celebrate, the feasts that we enjoy together. This is all a part of it. Okay, and Kabbalah is that tool. Uh, if we look at how a lot of prophets are doing it, we're concerned with the idea of the word. Because we've talked even recently in the sermon uh, about uh, the logos. And, and, and it is the word that becomes our key. And there's, there's techniques in delivering the word, there's techniques in hearing the word, in being responsive to culture and learning to listen to poetry in, in, in even everyday speaking. Because it's there, it's in the culture all around us, and that's what a good prophet really catches on to. Something that becomes you know, amazingly generic and obvious but that we have not seen it that way before. Um, so we get a sense of truth. We get a sense of new knowledge, of uh, being awakened to something that we didn't perceive before. And while it doesn't overtly change or obviously or apparently change our lives, we still go back to the same thing, but somehow a greater sense of meaning. Everything has changed. Our relationship to the world takes this dynamic leap. Um, 
even when when even when a great teacher in, in say grade school comes along and, and opens you up to something new, a new idea, you know, you want to bring that apple the next day and say thank you. You know, um, this is uh, it. But when we begin to justify it and yet another higher level, we get to this idea of preternatural conversation. We're talking with God and spirit. These are preternatural uh, contacts. But I think more interestingly, I spoke of it in another sermon, this human race has been around for hundreds of thousands of years. Some of these souls are so advanced. That to us, they are private human. They're not, you know, they've been through, you know, millions of incarnations even. So, uh, we are talking to ourselves. They live deep in our consciousness, this idea of a collective unconscious, I think, being very important. And so whether there are actual beings floating around in the heavens, I don't think that's important to consider. But to consider that their voices are embedded somewhere deeply inside of this consciousness that we seem to have and don't fully understand. And the Kabbalah helps us to understand that this isn't just a little thought growing inside of us or a creative thought growing inside of us, but that we are seeing some special type of communication that really is a part of all of us and a part of, uh, of everything that tells us something about human from intuition, you can develop it by developing that, that abstract process called divination, but then it grows into something even deeper, into processing. And it's a natural growth. It's like flexing a muscle. Um, you go to the gym, you push 10 pounds today, and you're pushing 15 pounds in a month. And it grows like that. And gnosis is a way of growing that prophecy comes to a personal level right on the grander aspect of a cultural or, or um, a, a racial uh, consciousness. Uh, we still have our own personal revelations that get us through our day-to-day -day lives. Tell us who we are. And these revelations are the things that have moved us our whole lives. Like somebody plays baseball, somebody becomes a painter, somebody uh, gets involved in a Gnostic church. Whatever that might be. Um, so, here's to real religion and its production of prophets, and, and may we each be one, at least for ourselves. Thank you. For Osiris Onophorus, who is found perfect before the gods, had said, These are the elements of my body, perfected through suffering, glorified through trial. For the scent of the dying rose is as the repressed side of my suffering, and the flame red fire is the energy of mine undaunted will. And the cup of wine is the pouring out of the blood of my heart, sacrificed unto regeneration, unto the newer life. The bread is the foundation of my body, which I transform red, red that it may be renewed. 
For I am Osiris triumphant, even Osiris on Ophrys, the justified. I am he who is clothed with the body of flesh, yet in whom is the spirit of the great gods. I am the Lord of life, triumphant over death. He who partaketh with me shall arise with me. I am the manifester in matter of those whose abode is in the invisible. I am purified. I stand upon the universe. I am its reconciler with the eternal gods. I am the perfecter of matter. And without me the universe is not. I am come in the power of the light. I am come in the mercy of the light. I am come in the light of wisdom. The light hath healing on its wings. Blessed be thou, Lord of the universe, for thy glory flows out to the ends of the universe, rejoicing. Through thirty ethers I am the forces of the universe in myself. I inhale the perfume of the rose for the air and the sweetness of life. I feel the warmth of this sacred lamp, the fire of my very own spirit. I taste this cake of light to nourish the foundations of my renewed body. I drink this wine that the body may become infused with spirit. And finally, the ringing of the bell chants my soul under the city of the pyramids. The ring of the bell enchants my soul into the city of the pyramids. I inhale the perfume of the rose. Sweetness of life. I feel the warmth of the sacred lamp, the fire of my very own spirit. I taste this cake of light to nourish the foundation of my renewed body.
I drink this wine that the body become infused with spirit. Finally, the ringing of the bell enchants my soul into the city of the pyramids. of the rose for the air is the sweetness of life. I feel the warmth of the sacred lamp, the fire of my very own spirit. I taste this cake of light to nourish the foundation of my renewed body. drink this wine that the body may become infused with the spirit. Finally, the ringing of the bell enchants my soul unto the city of the Fume of the rose, for the air is the sweetness of life. I feel the warmth of this sacred lamp, the fire of my very own spirit. I taste this cake of light to nourish the foundations of my renewed body. Drink this wine that the body become infused with spirit. Finally, the ringing of the bell enchants my soul into the city of the pyramids.
It operates in spite of one's self-indulgence and generates invulnerability and impeccability. He or she then walks the path with heart and waits for an opening to freedom. Sufficient personal power leads to the mastery of intent. Our reality is completely and entirely based on our intent. It is a sign of considerable advance when a man begins to be moved by the will, by his own energy self-determined, instead of being moved by desire, by a response to an external attraction or repulsion. Intent creates your reality. What are you intending for yourself? You can recognize it by listening to your real wishes, the ones with emotional buttons on them, the wishes that make you cry or scare you out to make you cringe or bring a huge smile across your face just thinking about them. They are very deep inside and they are the force that moves you in this life. Intelligence. All matter is alive and in its own way is intelligent. Matter is made manifest by its rate of vibration. The frequency of vibration in matter and its density provide for us a key to the level of consciousness dwelling in any being or object. Its rate of vibration shows us the degree of its intelligence. Nothing is dead or inanimate in nature. Everything exists in some degree of animation. Everything is alive and in its own way is an expression of universal mind. Only this all-pervading consciousness and intelligence is expressed in a different way in all the diverse beings made manifest. The degree of consciousness in any one thing corresponds to the degree of its density or the speed of its vibrations. The more dense the matter, the less conscious it is, the less intelligent. In our bodies, we must strive to raise the rate of vibration of our flesh, as we know that flesh contributes to the quality of thought in our brain. Also, the greater the rate of vibration of any particular being, the more conscious and the more intelligent the matter. Hence, intelligence is related to adaptation. The more intelligent an individual, the better able he or she is able to adapt to the circumstances of life. He or she then learns to accept the world as it is and is not confounded by finding it not to be what he or she might want it to be. Intuition. Every one of us possesses the faculty, the interior sense that is known by the name of intuition. But how rare are those who know how to develop it? It is, however, only by the aid of this faculty that men can ever see things in their true color. It is an instinct of the soul which grows in us in proportion to the employment we give it, and which helps us to perceive and understand the realities of things with far more certainty than our sensitivity of the senses and the exercise of our reason. What are called good sense and logic enable us to see only the appearance of things, that which is evident to everyone. The instinct spoken here being a projection of our perceptive consciousness, a projection which acts from the subjective to the objective, and not vice versa, awakens in us spiritual senses and power to act. These senses assimilate to themselves the essence of the object or of the action under examination, and represent it to us as it really is, not as it appears to our physical senses and to our cold reason. We begin with instinct, and we end with omniscience. The words of Madame Helene Petrovna Blavatsky. Lord bless you. The Lord enlighten your mind and comfort your hearts and sustain your body. The Lord bring you to the accomplishment of your true pure will. The great work, the sum and bone, true wisdom, and perfect happiness. Nice, we're glad we made it. No, I didn't make the last two times. Well, we're happy you did, man. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>